What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes and Spotify. Also, Instagram at talklouder underscore podcast. And of course, our website, talklouderpodcast.com. I'm Metal Dave, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. Uh, we've got a great guest today. This guy is the classic definition of rock and roll journeyman. He's been in numerous bands uh, throughout his career, some of them huge, uh, some of them not so much. We're going to talk all about them. He's also got some new material that he's sharing with the world right now. He's currently living in Nashville, Tennessee, and releasing uh, individual singles. Uh, we're going to talk to him about some of that. Uh, Jason and he have some history together. I'm talking about John Karabi. Jason, yeah. you want to tell us a little bit about your well, background first, with John? First off, it's it uh, you know it it doesn't have to be a secret that we we shoot our episodes with our guests and then we shoot these intros after. And I just have to say, it was just awesome to catch up with the guy. Yeah, because even you know I do these cruises sometimes, and he's always on these cruises. And uh, you you can't really there's so much going on you can't really just have coffee and just sit there for hours and catch up about old times and future times and family and where you are in your head uh, what kind of what guitar you're playing what it is you know in, any of yeah. that so it was just great to to catch up with him and and uh, relive a couple of of uh, what what I consider to be great moments. Uh, on the road with him and just little stories and things. It was great. Um, his single, Casi Bella. Yeah, Casi I don't do the Italian. Yeah, well, it's an Italian. I think it's Casi Bella, which yeah. means beautiful. So beautiful. So beautiful, correct. He's got a single. It's very different. Um, if you're expecting it to be heavy hitting, crotch grabbing rock and roll, it is not that. Um, he is a fantastic singer and songwriter. Yeah. And I think that him, I think the universe tends to take care of people and draw you where you need to be. And he's in Nashville where there are, uh, you know, plenty of singer songwriters and studios and things like that. And he's, like you said, he's a journeyman. <laughs> John, thanks for being here. Are you in Nashville currently? Is that where you live? Yep. I've been here since um, 2006. 2006. That's, um, that's a while. Yeah, I've been here. I, I came, you know, what's funny. I came down in like uh, 03, 04, some, some, somewhere around that time um, at a music publisher that I had met Um. At a some, I, it was weird. I don't golf, but I was at a celebrity golf tournament in Destin, Florida, and I met this guy. He said he owned a publishing company in Nashville, and so we, you know, kind of bullshitted. And I had a couple drinks with the guy, and then I guess he went home, and he started looking up my old stuff with the Scream and Motley and Union or whatever, and he called me on the phone, and he goes wow, dude, like I was really looking at you as like the lead singer of Motley Crue. But I didn't realize like he went back and he listened to songs like Father, Mother, Son. Of course. Um, Motley Crue, like Drift Away, Misunderstood, Love Shine, then Union. There was Robin Song, October Morning Wind. And he goes, wow, you've got a lot of great acoustic things. I'm like, yeah, I mean, pretty much. And I'm sitting here bullshitting everything that I've ever written. I've written on an acoustic guitar and then I translate it when I do the record. Wow, cool. Well, he said, would you like to come down to Nashville and maybe write with some of my guys on my roster? So I said, sure. So they flew me out. I stayed at a hotel and 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 it was weird. There's there was something to be said and I, you know, Texas is very much like this as well, but there's something to be said about Southern hospitality. Like I was completely blown away at the fact that I could go into a, a bar 
um, after I was done doing my writing thing. And I would walk into a bar alone, not know anybody. And I'd sit there, watch the TV, have a bite to eat. Somebody would sit down next to me and just go, hey, man, how you doing? You you musician? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, and then, but you're looking at him like I'm from Philadelphia. Yeah. And then transplanted to yeah, LA. That, yeah. That doesn't happen there. It yeah. doesn't happen. No. You know, you, people <laughs> in Philadelphia go, Hey, man, how you doing? I'm like, What the fuck do you want? You know, <laughs> you know, what it's right. So, right. There was a disconnect, but I really, I'm sitting there going, Wow, this is really sociable. People are yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I finally moved out here. And, and then to, to boot, the first day that I was here, I was renting a house in this area called Hermitage. And um, I left. I had a re recording session to do. And so I get in my car and I'm leaving. And as I'm getting into my car, I can see the neighbors like kind of looking across the street. You know, I'm wearing a tank top covered in tattoos, crazy hair. And the neighbors are like, fuck, you know. So I'm driving away going, fuck, man, they're going to burn my fucking house down. They're all thinking to themselves, there goes the neighborhood. We, we need to move. Um, and I swear to God, I got home at 10 o'clock at night. And there was a box on my front step. And I brought it in, wasn't taking. Was there burning dog shit inside? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm shaking it. It's not taking. It doesn't smell weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I take it in my house. I open it up, and all the neighbors got together. All the women, the wives, and they and the husband. They all left their addresses, their phone numbers, their names, and they they gave me bags of cookies and pies and all the shit. Hey, man, welcome to the neighborhood. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I lived in L.A. for 20 years, and I lived in apartment buildings and. I, I had zero interactions with my next door neighbor. This is insane. Yeah. So I moved. I'm like, fuck it. I'm here. I like it. I met my wife here. Yeah. So um, I, I dig it, man. Nashville's cool. You're There's a lot of now. You're a well, Southern yeah. man. You're a Southern man now. What, what's the old phrase? Uh, By the grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> there's there seems to be a lot of uh rock and rollers moving out to nashville I, I think cheetah chrome was living there for a while i think tom Kiefer lives out there dude um, i can honestly tell you since just since i've moved here um well tom lived here when i moved here tom eric and jeff yeah. god rest his soul yeah, yeah. um they already lived here since I've moved here, now it's like, it's unbelievable. So off the top of my head, Kid Rock, Derek St. Holmes, Brad Whitford, Steven Tyler, Vince Neal, Mick Mars, uh, all like all but Fred Corey. Fred Corey still lives in L.A. Uh, Winger, uh, the Nelson brothers. I mean, it's just. There's definitely a fucking rock market here now. Everybody yeah. used to associate it with country music, but there's a huge music scene here for everything, anything I, and everything. I, so I feel cool. like it's it, since it's a mecca for songwriters. Yeah. And it always has been a, a, a hotbed for that. And not ne in my eyes anyway, when you think about sure, you can say country music, but how about just music? Yeah. We live in a country and we write music. So it doesn't matter what kind of song, if you want to put things in boxes, that's fine. But I've always felt like Nashville has that thing. Um, and there's always been a rocker or two from that area. So now there's just this uh, sort of nest there. You know, I, I, I remember when Hollywood was kind of dying and burning uh, people were saying, oh, we're, we're headed to Vegas. And all of Hollywood moved to Vegas. And Which also has a massive, a massive influx of, of musicians as well. Yeah. Yes. And I yeah. just feel like a lot of West Coasters got out of there. Um, but, I, I mean, I feel like the Bay Area, speaking of California, I feel like the Bay Area is, is just another Nashville. You've got any kind of song... You've got any kind of player, you've got any kind of, you know. So, 
Yeah, I uh, let let's talk about your your new single and how uh, how that came about, um, and mix that up with uh, you know the last like twenty months and what you've been doing sitting on your bobo. Yeah, my bobo's actually starting to become quite sore um, <laughs> and for no other reason than I've been sitting on it for a while. That um, makes three of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, this, well, the Cassie Bell thing, man, you know, it, it, I'm getting a positive reaction from it, but the one thing that everybody says is, wow, not what I would have expected from you. Yeah. I said the same. Yeah, but you know the uh, funny thing I, is, I know that you can write that kind of a song. You can write any kind of song you want. I know that. So part of me was like, "Oh, this is weird," but it's not that weird. But it, it, it's funny. It, I, I I've been pretty much saying it. I hate to be redundant, but if you go back and you looked at all the interviews that I've done over the last twenty-five plus years. People always ask you, you know this, Jason, they go, oh, man, so who influenced you? And I've always said from day one, if I could put them in order, number one, the Beatles. Number two, Led Zeppelin. Number three, Aerosmith. And a strong fourth would be Queen. So I was yeah. sitting down um, with Cassie Bella, this song that's out now, um, when I was writing with Marty Fredrickson, for what became the dead Daisy's last record with me, uh, burn it down. Um, we were, we just got together prior to us all really getting together in New York and Marty and I sat down and just worked on some things. And I had the idea, I showed it to him. Um, I had a little bit of a different course. Marty's like, dude, you're overthinking it. You're putting too much in there. Just dumb it down. And so we came up with the chorus for it. I recorded it on my trusty pocket studio. <laughs> and so when we got together with the daisies, we all just used to throw ideas on the table and I played it for them. And they kind of went, Rrr. you know, I, what is this? I, wh where are you going with this idea? So I just went, okay, not really doesn't fit the box, as you said, of the dead daisies. So I put it away. Um, I left the daisies in January of 19. Um, I was busier than shit doing acoustic shows and just shows in Australia and just all over January of 2020. I called Marty. I said, dude, I want to do a record. You know, will you help me? Yep. So we started looking at shit COVID hits. Um, but this idea, I looked at it again and I found it on my phone. I've got, God, fuck, 80, 80 ideas on my phone that I've still got to get to a bunch. And um, now when the COVID thing hit, I was saying earlier that my I panicked. I'm like, all of my money nowadays comes from touring. Mm -hmm. So I freaking out I'm, and I was kicking myself in the ass for not having learned Pro Tools or learned how to record myself. I'm reliant on other people. Now we're in a pandemic. Nobody wants to be in the same room with anybody. So what am I going to do? So I took classes, learned how to do the Pro Tools thing. Um, I, again, I'm really rough at it. I don't know. It, it takes me days to do something Marty would do in an hour or two. Um, but I'm moving forward. You're talking oh. to two of the most non-techy motherfuckers <laughs> born. Yeah. So yeah, we feel it, your pain. Yeah, it's just like, you know, like, it, but I, you know what? It's weird. I felt proud of myself, even though it takes me a while to do something that somebody else can do in a matter of minutes. Yeah. I kind of felt a sense of accomplishment because, you know what? I kind of figured this out. I'm moving forward. Yeah. You know? So I did it and um, I talked to Marty. I said, I'm, I'm going to look at that, that Beatlesque tune that we had. So I started recording it and I put it down and I emailed it to Marty and he immediately got it. And I, I wrote to him in the email when I sent him the files. I said, I'm really kind of hearing this be like 
Penny Lane by the Beatles meets Killer Queen by Queen. Mm -hmm. And he got it. Um, Obviously, I don't sound like either one of those singers, Paul McCartney or, or, or Freddie Mercury. So I had to kind of give it my own little thing. But I'm really pleased with the way it came out. And at the end of the day, I recorded most of that track here on a laptop in my bedroom. Nice. So I kind of feel like, yeah, now, uh, you know, I've got other stuff that I've recorded that's already done. And I'm still sitting in here every day working on new shit and just trying to get a little better. I've kind of figured out how to edit drums and get them, you know, now the next thing is, you know, difference like the the drums I do, I do on a MIDI machine, a drum machine. So it's literally editing dots or whatever. My next thing is figuring out how the wave files work, how to clip, fade, cut, and all that other shit. I, I don't know any of that. So anytime I want to redo a guitar part, or I'm like, oh, that that part needs to be here, and that needs to be here. I just erase everything, and I start over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's just, I, I, can't, I haven't figured out how to cut and paste yet. But it, that's a, whatever. That's amazing that you kind of, that you had, well, you know, you you had a no shit moment and I, that was your incentive to just get in there and get your hands dirty you had to do it you didn't have a choice well i you know and again i mean here we are 18 months later dude and i literally just had you know a shit ton of gigs cancel postpone you know um, you know what fuck it we'll do it next 2022 i'm like well that's not doing me any good now yeah. You know, I need to pay my fucking electric bill. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So I'm just sitting here going, fuck, like it was, it was kind of out of desperation and necessity. Like, okay, if I can learn to master this, I can, even if I don't release things like on like Spotify or whatever, I, I, I have my own website. Now I could put a player on there and a little credit card thing. Even if I do covers or whatever, um, I can always be releasing new music and make some money here and there. You know what I mean? Just to supplement myself until, cause who knows when this is going to go away, all of this shit, you know what I mean? So I, I don't know. I just want to get back like all of us get back to holding the guitar and standing on stage behind a microphone and yeah. into some people. Of so, course. Who knows well, how it's going to turn out? Well, the singles, it sounds like you, even though it's, uh, quite different. It sounds like you. The uh, I get the the temp the tempos very uh, like you said. Penny Lane killer. Yeah, I hear tempo, the Penny Lane in it for sure. The tempo is kind of kind of in that realm, uh, if not spot on. Those those two somewhere in the middle, and I love the harmony guitar, which is super complementary to uh, the melody and the chorus um and, how, and you know you know it's weird to like you know I, I i play guitar i'm you know i'm adequate on guitar i'm not an eddie van halen or i'm not you know a lead guy but it's it took me a while you know i i took me like i just had this solo on loop and i'm like oh fuck you know four hours later i'm still sitting there my ears are bleeding i'm like this is fucking brutal i don't know how people do this for a living turn it into work right yeah you know supposed to feel like that yeah i eventually figured it out and again i had to figure out the solo to a point where i could play it from front to back like I didn't know how to punch in. Like I'm sitting here going, fuck, like, you know, so I, I, I was literally figuring it out. Like, okay, I'll do this after this. And, you know, it, I just did it over and over and over again till I felt confident enough to where I could go play record. And I, I laid the front, you know, the main, the bull, the first solo laid it down one shot. Nice. And then, then it took me another fucking six hours to figure out all the harmony notes because I'm not, I don't, I have no zero schooling. I get it. I don't know how to read. You know, I'm yep. like, I I'm think. Say I'm from, I went to the same school as you, which is none. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. so, so John, 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying each process of the guitar solo was just, I mean, I might as well just reach up my ass and remove my wisdom teeth. It was like, <laughs> ah, are you kidding me? So I had to, you know, learn the guitar solo so I could play it from top to bottom, then learn the harmony so I could play it from top to bottom, learn the other harmony, figure it out so I could play it from top to bottom. And it was just like, oh, fuck. And I think there was a couple notes in there that were janky and Mar Marty went, OK, <laughs> you know what I mean? Whatever. But it, it is what it is. So so you you may have answered my next question in 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 just right there. But um, I was going to ask you, it seems that your strategy at this point is to release singles rather than uh, collect enough songs to put out an album. Um, what is that, you know, sort of out of necessity because you're learning as you go and you're you're sort of capturing one at a time and releasing them no, one at a time? I already I already have probably close to an album's worth of material, if not. Um, I was actually doing the album with Marty prior to uh, the COVID thing. Right. And then, um, you know, the, everybody went under a rock and, you know, I learned how to do this. And then at one point there was some ideas that were lingering that Marty and I had started working on together. And um, he moved to Florida. He was here in Nashville for a while and bought a house in Florida. So I called him and I said, hey, dude, I, it was funny. I didn't even know he moved. I'm like, hey, dude, you going to be in the studio this week? He's like, I don't live there anymore. And I'm like, fuck, where are you at? He's like, I'm in Florida. So we talked and I made arrangements. I have a motor home. Uh, found out where Marty lived and I rented a thing and I went down there. And while we were at his house, kind of working on some ideas, that's when Marty kind of poked the bear and he goes, dude, why are you doing a record? And I'm like, again, I was, I was saying, I'm like, it is okay. Is this a trick question or I'm a <laughs> musician? Like, why wouldn't I do a fucking record? Right. It's what you do. Um, yeah. I, hello. Um, <laughs> you know, brain surgery is kind of out of the question at this point. So <laughs> let's do a record. Right. Um, but he kind of put everything into perspective. He goes, dude, the, the amount of people that actually buy the physical product, if you look at record sales anymore, the percentage in the global scheme of things, that number is so small of the people like Jason who go to the record store and buy vinyl or buy CDs or, you know what I mean? I mean, if you really look at it, I've got a car that was made in 2019 that doesn't even have a CD player in it. Yeah, I it's know. Plug your phone in and go. Right. So he's like, nobody's selling any records. And so I, again, I thought about it and I. Unless I you're AC, at, unless you're ACDC. Because Power Up, I think, went platinum. And vinyl, I, and I'm, vinyl, I'm sure, vinyl, you know, the band, yeah. your, your, listen, your ACDCs, uh, your U2s, uh, your, right. your Madonnas, your whatever. Right. Metallica, gonna, Iron Maiden. Yeah, they're going to go out and they're going to do what they're going to do. Be, but you're talking about bands that have 40, 50 year history. Yeah. Correct. Um, guys like you and I who kind of made a dent, but didn't really, you know, uh, whatever. I relate. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. So, so, so a lot of this uh, is pointing into one sort of area that uh, sounds like he made you look at in this conversation. And that is the end of the attention span to actually quote the new Armored Saint album has a song called end of the attention span and that's pretty much where where we are is i think that um by you know putting a song out or even just an ep you're probably doing yourself a little bit of a favor and are able to see um fruit on the tree faster than if you're trying to make a record and sell 10 songs to somebody they're like what well, wait what what wait so you know you're giving there, them a bullseye there's, there's, i mean if you go back jason and look at things and this is this is nothing new i mean no. i think since the days of 
Buck, Elvis. Right. You know, Elvis gets signed. Elvis becomes fucking international superstar. And then every record label on earth is trying to find the new Elvis. Right. Then the Beatles come along and they're trying to find the new Beatles. And it's just been that way forever. I mean, you look at, uh, I mean, Guns N' Roses. I mean, I was in fucking, I was in LA when that whole thing happened. And it was like, it was, it was crazy. You walk down the street and the two bands that really made a dent back then in 85, 86, 87 was GNR and Poison. So you would pass one guy that looked like Axel, one guy that looked like Brent, one guy looked like Axel, one guy looked, and it was like the market, they, they just saturate the markets now. So that's always been the case. Now yeah. enter in this. Also, yeah. This is a jukebox in your back pocket. Yeah. And so that took that old adage of 15 minutes to fame, 15 minutes of fame. And it's really taken it down to like two and a half minutes. Yeah. <laughs> because if, if you're, that. you flood the market, everything's accessible, eh, 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 tired of it. Move along. Boom, boom, right. boom. You know, so. So here, you know, let me interrupt again. Singles are, let's go back to what you said, Elvis. Elvis made singles. It was yeah. one song at a time. He wasn't looking to make a record. They just waited till he had enough material to make a record. And it was usually the, only the one song, the 45, the little, the one boom yep. is what they really focused on. And so that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah, we're, it's, it's weird. It's kind of an, uh, it's a combination of old and new right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, I'm, I'm kind of old, but I, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm like, I, I have no idea how this shit works. Yeah. You know, uh, mention, mention again, where they can, where they can buy the yeah. single and, and, and some other things. I'm just going to lay a broad thing out there anywhere you can do digital downloads. It's available on Amazon music, yeah. Apple tunes, iTunes, which I just figured out are two different things. I thought they were the same thing until recently. Um, but well, all after, your after this conversation, well. I'll probably still walk away going, yeah, it's the same thing. <laughs> no, it's, I, I didn't realize it. Until I, I just saw my my own thing. I, I'm working like a PR firm that does a lot of this electronical bull voodoo. Right. They just made a thing for me. And I'm looking at the things going, oh, cool. Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio. Apple tunes, iTunes. Wait, what? I thought they were the same. I thought it was the same company. Apple, I, wait, different companies. You got me. Who knew? You got um, me. So anywhere it's, anywhere you can download it. Um, it's, and it's on all the streaming services as well. Awesome. You if, you don't, if you don't mind, let's, uh, let's talk about some of your history. Now yeah. I want to jump in and kind of, uh, bring bring a little bit of uh, of our history and how we met john do you remember the first time we met and how we met and what was happening well i'm probably wrong here uh i know we shared the same manager mr tim heine and john greenberg well yeah and i don't tim know it, i don't know if this was uh after we met like that you're talking? Yeah, we did. Was it my, was it, didn't my wife do your hair and makeup for a photo session with, with Niels Lozauer? Niels Lozauer, and you were the gopher. You were the driver. Wow. We, we as a band rode and in look your, at me now. I'm still a driver and still a gopher. <laughs> <laughs> rode in your, your little, I don't know what it was. It was like a little, I don't know. I want to say it was a Pinto. I know it wasn't a Pinto, but you had a little... <laughs> Uh, maybe it was Val's car. Maybe it was your yeah, wife's car. Yeah, the first letter right. It was a piece of shit. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> right, right. A pin piece of shit. Uh, you know, a little, little stick shift thing. I don't remember what it was. And we went around and did location stuff. Yeah. And that was the first time we met. Hey, dude, are you in a band? Yeah, I'm a singer. Yeah, oh, well, I'm from Philly, but I moved out here and da 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 and we didn't know who the hell you were. And next thing you know, you were, you were, Hey, you're the guy, you're the driver. <laughs> you're the, you're the, you're Niels Lozauer's driver. Da, 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 da. It's like, what? Wait a minute. I never thought of you as the driver ever again after that, especially after I heard you sing. Um, 
Heine took me to see a band called what was it? Saints and Sinners. Saint, yeah, Saints or Sinners. Okay. And, and um, I think it might have been an acoustic thing. Was I it would, at the Coconut Teaser? It was that Spice? Spice. Oh. Wow. I got to stop or, or drinking. Might, I don't remember any have, of this. It might have been the coconut teaser, but I remember it being Spice. And I remember you guys, I felt like you guys were sitting down on stools, but it was a full band, it was a four-piece band. Yep. Did that band turn into The Scream? Yeah, we, we had a little difficulty finding a name. Mm. Um, we were initially, for a minute or two, a couple shows, Racer X. Oh, right. Um, because of the, of the John and or Juan and Bruce guys that you had. Right. Um, then we were. Fuck. Saints or sinners. OK. Oddly enough, an old guitar player friend of mine from Philadelphia copy wrote that name so we couldn't use that. OK. Then we were called the Black Cloud. Weird. Um, which I. I kind of think now in hindsight was fucking perfect. Um, right, right. And uh, then we were going to call ourselves sons of silence and Gil Monty, my tattoo guy at the time, he goes, dude, you can't call yourself sons of silence. I go, why? He goes, there's a motorcycle gang in like fucking New Mexico. Oh. We'll just kill you guys. Yeah. And I go, okay, good yeah, to know. That, that, okay, <laughs> again. So we went through like 20 fucking names and Walt, to be honest with you, yeah. Walt Woodward, God rest yeah. his soul. Yeah. He goes, let's just call it the scream, dude. We're like, that's it, gotta be fucking taken. Sure shit. They ran a copyright on it. Nobody had it. It was available. Okay, right. Call ourselves the scream. Yeah. Done. Uh, yeah. Dave Grohl had a, had a band called scream and in, in Seattle but for some reason it wasn't right registered. No, no, it's not yeah. registered. So <clears throat> how many shows do you think you did as saints or sinners? Probably the one you were at. Nice. <laughs> so the, the me and me, me and Tim Heine, that ticket stuff, buddy, <laughs> me and your manager, our, our manager and like the other six people and the bartender's dog are the ones that saw Saints or sinners. Exactly. Nice. Save that ticket stub. That will go down in history. Nice. And that would have <laughs> you had may been... have the only one in history. Nice. What year? What year do you think that was? Because I'm not even gonna try. Ninety. 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 Eighty. Late eighty nine. Ninety. Yeah. 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 So this is uh, this is me and you. At Spice, that's me and you sharing a mic, which is a no-no now, because we know we could get each other's cooties, and that's at Spice. <laughs> and I've got one more. This is dangerous. This is a dangerous toys gig, at Spice, uh, where you were just in attendance, and we pulled you up at the end, and we did that Aerosmith medley. We ended up doing later on on tour with you guys, The Scream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, and you know what I see when I see those photos? All I see is, God, look how skinny I was. Yeah. Well, same here. Look, I'm not wearing a shirt. I'm, I had my, I had my shirt off when it when it when it was. I I thought it was okay to walk around without half naked. And I'm I'm, I'm shirtless with a vest on. Those yeah. days are gone, my friend. Yeah. Yes, long <laughs> effing gone. So this was usually this was so we did that scream. The scream put out a record. Uh, obviously, Saints or Sinners got their shit together. Can't be Racer X, but I always looked at it as like, man, this this record is so badass. This band is so badass because let's face it, you got guys from Racer X in the band. You got shredding bass and guitar. All you got a killer band to back you up. And that driver guy. <laughs> yeah, that driver on that lead drivers vocals. on vocals. <laughs> yeah, that, that guy. Drove. That, that guy, guy drives really well. That guy that roadies for <laughs> Niels Lozauer's photo shoots. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So funny. Anyway, so we did that tour. We went through, I believe, the Midwest. Uh, this was Dangerous Toys in the Scream. 
we did like the Carolinas. We did, um, we did Florida. I think we were in Florida for like a week. And as a side note, one of the greatest experiences of my life, we did oh, it together. Here we go. No, no, no. Was um, if you remember, it might might have been the first or second livestock festival in Zephyr Hills, Florida. Yes. And I just remember we got there early this was in, in 1992, day. by the way. Uh, it was 91. 91. Okay. Yeah. Cause um, we did. Yeah, the I, I was on, I was on, uh, I, I, the toys were out with Judas priest and motorhead and uh, Alice Cooper in summer of 91. So, this okay so here it's it's really funny because i had to think about this i wrote a book and i had to go back oh. and i had to refresh myself with some of the dates but <clears throat> we um 90 is when you saw you know saints or sinners okay, thing. Right. We, we took a little while we wrote we did the record it came out in 91 right um we we did a tour with the bullet boys we came home and then we went right back out with you guys. Okay. Um, now we started the Bullet Boys tour. I would, I would have to say early summer, and we, and then we came back. We were out with them five, six weeks, seven weeks. Came back and went right back out with you guys. I would say late summer, early fall. Early fall. Yeah, and we yeah. did a, a okay. full tour with you guys. Yeah. And then we kind of went back out again. Um, if you remember, too, um, I know there was a point where we were in Panama City, Florida. You guys went on with uh, Juan and Walt went on and Bruce and I had to go to England and promote the record overseas for like literally one day we came back Um we did that. That was like, yeah, we, we were on tour with you guys. It was late. I, I want to say autumn of 91. We did the East Coast. We got down into Florida. And the coolest thing was pulling up in the afternoon, giant empty field. And we're sitting there like, well, you know, this killer festival stage. We're hanging out. We're, you know, meet, there was a few stragglers meeting people. I took a nap on my coach and then I woke up, got dressed, did my little quick vocal exercise. And I walked up the ramp, they were playing music and I, I peeped out of the curtain and there was like 50,000 fucking people there. It was the great. And then you guys played and then we went out and we did that little Aerosmithy thing yeah. at the very end. It was awesome. Yeah. It was so cool. That was probably the pinnacle of the tour. That was of the tour we did. That was probably the best moment. Most and to be honest with you, until I joined the Daisies, that was the biggest show, biggest attendance I had ever played to. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, do you remember who was headlining? Because I don't <clears throat> think it was the toys. Do you remember who think, was, was there a band it, after us? No, the, the first night it was kind of um there was somebody before us. Right. And then they had it was some weird like cuz the screen was doing really well in Florida. You guys had already been established. So I think we kind of did some sort of weird co-headlining thing that last night. But if you remember too, that was the year some crazy motherfucker drove through the crowd. They were airlifting people out of, and he drove through the campgrounds, just running tents over and all this other kind of shit. They were airlifting people out while we were on stage at that right. show. Wow. Yeah. They Holy were, crap. I could see a helicopter like <laughs> literally in the field, like landing and then taking off while we were on stage. Um, but wow, also that I think the second night, um, it was the year Soundgarden played mm. in the Chili Peppers. Mm -hmm. So they had just come on that blood, sugar, sex, yeah. magic uh -huh. thing. But it was like this awesome three-day festival, man. It was it was killer. It yeah, was, that was great. I can't, great I can't remember 
our last uh, show. Um, I don't know if you do. I guess that's a form of a question, but but it's customary for uh, you know at the last night of a tour for the bands to give each other uh, not hand jobs but you know uh, <laughs> gifts of some sort. You know, kiss lunchbox. Uh, you know, smack in the face, uh, sabotage each other's set. Do you remember the toys coming out in their underwear, setting up a picnic table, and playing a round of cards on stage while you guys were <laughs> <laughs> you guys were playing your hit song, and we come out with a card table and stools and sit around and start dealing cards, playing playing poker on stage while you guys are playing <laughs> playing your single in our underwear. I I um. Yeah, but for the life of me, I remember that, but I can't remember what we did to you guys. You guys came out and duct taped me to my mic stand. You taped my boots to the floor. You, you taped <laughs> you. You just started wrapping tape around my legs. You were duct taping me. You just started. You guys came out and two rolls of duct tape started taping me. And I think all the other guys were running away from from John and Bruce. You know what? And, 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 that, and that's the shit, dude. That it's, it's, it's hilarious. But I kind of miss those days. Like, people just, don't do that shit anymore. It was in Greensboro, North Carolina. I don't know why, but it just hit me like a ton of bricks. It was wow. in Greensboro, North Carolina. That's funny. So do you remember what you guys gave the toys as a, as a gift? As I, a party, I'm, I'm afraid to even ask. <laughs> baseball bat a t-ball bat oh t-ball bat all you guys signed it? signed it wow what the wow. fuck are you there's kidding your, me there's your name right there bro that's insane dude it says <laughs> you guys fucking rule i love y'all john karabi there's stuff on here that kind of makes me tear up a little bit uh wow. waltz on here john alderetti says I'm fucked up on Jack for the first time in eight years, only for Dangerous Toys, John Alderetti. Wow. That's awesome, dude. That is I've awesome. held on to this for obviously th these, these mo for this moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for this moment, I held on to this. That's awesome. Token of love. I, I, okay, now, is there any particular reason, if you can refresh my memory, why did we give you guys a baseball bat? We're called Dangerous Toys. Ah, uh, there it is. Okay. It all makes perfect sense now. I mean, is not, not know, really, but I mean, <laughs> close enough. Close I think enough. that close enough for I, rock and roll. I mean, I think that, you know, you can go to a toy store and buy a baseball bat and it's dangerous. <laughs> In the wrong hands, especially a T-ball <laughs> bat, because it's kind of a, it's, it's a, you know, warriors come out and play. Yeah, you yes, know, it's yes, all, yes. Oh, all coming, coming, it's coming together now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got it. So yeah, I, I don't know how much time we have with John, but I want to, I want to jump ahead because there's some questions I want to ask that. Well, yeah. let me, I think we got uh, my next one is in 15 minutes. Perfect. Okay, that's plenty. So we're gonna we're gonna roll fast through these because I want to get on. I want to touch on a couple things. Uh, the elephant in the room, obviously, the Motley Crue album that you did. Um, there are a lot of people, hardcore Motley Crue fans, and people that are friends of mine that to this day swear up and down that is the best Motley Crue album in the entire catalog. I mean, that's got to make you feel pretty good, man. Because I mean, commercially, it didn't do the business that some of the other albums did, but. Uh, you had the cards stacked against you, came in, did an album, and a lot of Motley Crue fans who can be very picky and loyal and that sort of thing hold that record in high regard. You know what, dude? Um, I, I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate the fans that did give it a, a chance. Um, you know, but uh, being in Motley was... A blessing. It was also a curse because I spent five years of while I was in the band. I can't even say five years. I still get hate mail from the fans that didn't like it. Wow. Um, you know, and I'm like, 
for fuck's sake, dude, seriously, or just these comments, um, you know, and it, it inevitably, again, this is just how it works. I, just this morning, um, I got up, I was having some coffee. I knew I had some press to do and, you know, but I, I go on my phone and, and I'm just inundated with emails. Hey dude, any truth to this, any truth to this, any truth. And so in the last week or two, um, somebody posted, um, something about Vince's performance at this thing called vet fest. Right. Um, and the fans are demanding that, Motley bring John Karabi back. Right. And I'm just sitting there going, fuck. And then a couple days later, there's somebody runs with a story like Nikki six issues, ultimatum to Vince Neal lose 50 pounds or we're bringing John Karabi back. Wow. And then this morning I have it. I have it right here. You'll laugh at it. It's fucking hilarious. I don't know where, these people get these ideas or this shit from, but today I woke up and this was in the, I don't know if you could see this. Yeah, yeah. we can see that. Yeah. Hold secret rehearsal with John Karabi, Vince Neal to be ousted. Wow. What the hell <laughs> did so, uh, I'm like, I, you know, I had a great time with the guys. I'm very proud of the record, but all of this bullshit, really made me um, l look inside myself, like standing on stage and having fans hold up a sign like, fuck you, where's Vince? Or, you know what I mean? Yeah. It makes you like at first I was rattled by it. But then I'm like, you know what? There's nothing I can do about this. All of this shit is out of my control. Blah, 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 blah. This morning I posted something finally after a week of bullshit clickbaiting. I basically just said, okay, here's three things you need to know. I'm positive Nikki did not ulti you know, give Vince an ultimatum and use me as leverage. No. Number one. Number two, there were no secret rehearsals, zero. And number three, after the way they portrayed me in the dirt movie <laughs> and the comments made by a certain member of the band about my writing talents and my lack of contributions to the record that I was on, I wouldn't fucking do it anyway. Right, so yeah. let it go. It's never going to happen. I wish the guys best of luck and with everything they do, but fucking I'm out. Like, stop it. It's not going to happen. Nice. Yeah, the, guy, the, the guy Sweet. that played you in the movie looked like a mouth breather. They were, oh. <laughs> you know what, I was like, I was like, Karabi is not like that at all. The guy is super spry and fun. The guy they had was like, a, duh. <laughs> and, and, and I took that, to be honest with you, like if you really go back and look at some of the comments that have been made in the last couple of years mm. by a certain member of that band. Mm hmm. In regards to me, I, I took that as an intentional slap in the face. Mm, yeah. And I'm like, I just kind of, to be honest with you, I'm like, you know what? I, there's no reason to have me in the fucking movie anyway. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do it, I just, I was pissed. I'm like, if, if you're going to put me in the fucking movie, then at least give me the respect of having Morgan Freeman play me. Yes. <laughs> Fuck yeah. off. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. And, and he would be totally into it. And I have I have proof right here. Boom. OK. So there we have it. There's Morgan Freeman and I just hanging out. He's playing my guitar. He's wearing my hat. We're just having a good old time. That is together. Morgan Freeman playing you. <laughs> Who made that? What is that all about? Who made I, that? I, I was, I, there's a girl in uh, Atlanta, Georgia named Michelle, uh, Michelle Reed. She's a photographer and she okay. took some photos of me in Atlanta. And she goes, oh, these photos are coming out really good. And I'm like, oh, cool. I go, don't, don't forget, please put them through the Morgan Freeman um, filter. Ad yeah. filter. Awesome. To make me look cool. 
So she took his face and put it on my body. And it oh, was that like, is I've, I've had a lot of fun with that. That's but it's crazy. just like, guys, let it go, man. You yeah. know, I yeah. swear to God, I look at life and you, we all do. Yeah. I look at life as a car. You put the car in drive. The intention is to move forward. If you're looking in the rear view mirror while the car is going forward, you're going to hit something and crash. Yeah. So stop looking in the mirror. I'm not. Yeah. 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 So let me ask you also, um, I I wanted to know, because I, in the fine print on this album right here, there is one John Karabi credited as playing guitar on every track on the Brides of Destruction debut album. And, um, it almost sounds like uh, you, perhaps maybe your songwriting partnership with Nikki kind of continued into Brides. Correct me if I'm wrong, but ultimately what happened and why did that, did, did your involvement end with that band? I didn't care for the record. Really? I, I, I it, you know, and in all honesty, in, in hindsight, I don't hate the record. I, I, I didn't, I was confused um, as to what direction, you know, like everybody could say, every, oh, we're, we're eclectic, we're this, we're that, we're, you know, all this shit. But we all know when you do a record, even if you're eclectic, there has to be some sort of a thread that runs through everything that makes everybody go, this is Dangerous Toys, this is The Scream, this is Motley, whatever. Yeah. And I kind of was sitting there scratching my head going, I don't, what is the thread here? We were all over the place. And if you really look at the record, there was a couple songs on there that was like, there was a song called Two Times Dead or whatever. That was, it sounded like a leftover Motley 94 song. And then you listen to the song Life, which was, I felt, the radio friendly song on the entire record, the best song on the record wasn't written by anybody in the band, Nikki and some outside writer. And then the singer that they were trying to push London was, you know, they were like, Oh, the greatest singer ever. Oh, this guy's awesome. Da, 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 da. And then we do life and the drummer singing it because the singer wasn't. And I'm going, what the fuck? Like, And honestly, we asked Bob Rock to produce the record and Bob said almost verbatim what I said. So I just went, I don't, you know, now I was also going through a divorce and all this other shit. And I tap, I wanted to tap out and just get my head together, whatever. And I did that. But I just, I was just sitting there looking at the record going, man, I I don't, I don't understand what's happening here. I was really I was super excited about that band because I thought the lineup was really great. And I saw and heard some potential in London uh, as a singer, but I tend to agree with you. I think half of it has a certain consistency and then the other half of it is kind of a little. Meandering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I hear you. I hear you. I mean, if you really look at the songs, dude, even even the heavier songs, if you look at, a, you know, shut the fuck up. And yeah. two times dead. Shut the fuck up. It's got almost kind of a metal punk thing going. Yeah. Yeah. And then two times dead still sounds like something from the Motley 94 record. Yeah. So I'm going, I, I just wasn't, and it could be me. You know, I've, I've talked to Tracy guns about it. Tracy was a little upset with me when I said it, but I explained everything to him and he goes, Oh, you know, whatever to each his own like that. Yeah. That's my opinion. So I just said, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to hang here. Like I, 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 I'm not the type of person that can go through the motions just for a buck. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to do it. Right. So I left the band. I said, in all fairness, I'm going to stand on stage and smile and act like I'm into this record. I'm, I'm kind of deceiving myself and I'm deceiving the fans. So I'm out. Yeah. See you guys have good luck. Wow. Yeah. Uh, one last question I wanted to get to, at least from my end, um, I have to ask you about Dead Daisies. Now, there was a band that had some uh, success and some fantastic musicians, um, and you were involved in three of those albums, I believe, at, at least three studio albums, possibly an additional live album. 
But in your estimation, what what is the reason that Dead Daisies could not keep a consistent lineup together? It's well, first of all, everybody's looking at it as a band. OK, and they, they've gone out of their way to let everybody know it's on the website. It never once says band. It says a collective. So right. it's it's always been that way. Um, that's kind of the, the day and age that we're in now anyway. I mean, I can name, you know, 50 musicians that are doing eight different things at the same time. They're yeah. just trying to keep busy. Well, <laughs> you know, I know broken teeth and, you know, whatever. But it's like you got to do what you got to do. You're a musician. So, and, and some things fit into a wheelhouse and you may write something that's perfect for dangerous toys. Um, you might write some things you go, oh, this isn't right for dangerous toys, but broken teeth can do it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you just stay busy. You're, that's you're, becoming creating, normal. you're doing your thing. Yeah, that's um, becoming the normal. Yeah. And, and honestly, my time with the Daisies was great. I had a great time with them. I'm very proud of everything that we did. But the Dead Daisies for me started to become the only thing that I could do. Uh, I had I had already, already had a band with my son as my drummer. And the entire time I was in the Daisies, he's like, Dad, you know, God, what's going on? Like, when are we touring again? <laughs> and I'm just like, it, it, the Dead Daisies. And some people would go, well, that's a good thing. It, it just became all encompassing. Yeah. And I just was like, I mean, and their work schedule was brutal. So yeah. I just went, you know what? I'm going to take some time, go try this, catch my breath. I had just gotten married in August of 2014. And in February 2015, I was in the daisies and gone for like four years. Yeah. Wow. So I just wanted to spend some time with my family, try releasing some of my own music, get, get, go do some shows with my kid and, you know, just give it a roll. So, yeah. yeah. Interesting perspective. A lot of people uh, as fans and outsiders, we don't always see that side of the equation. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. That's a very valid point now that you explain it. And somebody asked me that the other day when I mentioned it, they're like, yeah, I guess guess a lot of the fans don't realize. And uh, like, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I couldn't picture myself doing anything else. But there is a thing, you know, and Jason knows my son, like he saw him when he was a little kid. Yeah, like and a one of my biggest regrets is that I did not in any way, shape or form. I wasn't there for my kids, birthdays, graduations, weddings. Like I Almost. was gone. I was on tour all the time. Yeah. So I, I'm just older now um, and I want to be able I want to be in more in control of where I work, when I work and how hard I work. Like I want to spend some time with my family now as well. Sure. I've got granddaughters now, you know, all my kids, you know, everybody's, I missed a lot of their lives. So I want to make the most of every minute that I, you know, I'm breathing. John, it's been fantastic to talk to you today. I've loved yeah, every absolutely. moment of it. I love it that you're just sticking your head out there trying to be John Karabi. You've been John Karabi the whole time and not just a gopher for Niels Lowe's hour. <laughs> I knew that was coming back. If you weren't going to bring it back, I was going to bring it back. <laughs> well, he gave me the middle finger. I just well, wanted to bring it up. You beat me to the punch. Way. I was going to list that as one of his credentials as we signed out. Yeah. But <laughs> so so I, just, I just think that it's fantastic that you, that you know what, what John Karabi has to do. Um, it doesn't, you know, it... Wouldn't, wouldn't we all like to have been in a band where it's just one band your entire life like Lars Ulrich? He's only yeah. had one band the whole time. So, yeah. And that's amazing when you it, it didn't really happen to me. It didn't really happen to you. It didn't happen to Dave. That's the cards yeah. we were dealt. That's right. So, you know, we, we're not making it up as we go along. You're just John Karabi all the time, whether it, you're in this band for a while and this band for a while. You have to look out for you, especially now that we're all elder gents. We're still s singing our asses off and playing rock and roll, and uh, it's it's been it's been great talking to you, Dave. You can take yeah. us out. 
Yeah, John, I just wanted to thank you for your time today. Uh, your stories were great, and I, I really appreciate your down-to-earth attitude and how honest you were uh, uh, with some of the questions. You know, a lot of guys tend to candy coat things, and uh, they worry about how they're going to be per- portrayed in the press and worried about future career opportunities and everything. And you were, you know, right down the middle, honest and open, and I appreciate that. Well, and I appreciate you guys still wanting to talk to an old geezer like me. So, uh, Not at all, man. Yeah, no, we appreciate it. And with that, we'll let you go. I know you got a busy day ahead of you. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave, along with our special guest, John Karabi, joining us today on the Talk Louder podcast. Thank you all for listening, and thank you, John, for being here. Nice. Hey, there you go. Hey, John. Take care, buddy. <laughs>